welcome everybody to our University of Washington Cardiology Grand Round series. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you one of our colleagues from our Department of Neurology, uh, Dr. Malvika Sharma. Uh, Dr. Sharma did her neurology residency uh, at Boston Medical Center uh, and then followed that with a vascular neurology fellowship. Uh, she's an assistant professor of neurology here at the University of Washington and she'll be speaking, us, speaking to us today about stroke, the crossroads of neurology and cardiology. Dr. Sharma, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, too bad that we have to do it remotely. We look forward to meeting you in person, uh, but uh, thanks for joining us for our Grand Round series. Um, and then after uh, you present, we'll certainly have time to take questions uh, and I look forward to that as well. So take it away, Dr. Sharma, thanks. Great, well, thank you, Dr. Roth, and thank you all for um, inviting me to speak on the crossroads of neurology and cardiology stroke, at least in my opinion. Um, so this morning, I'd like to briefly review stroke epidemiology, uh, the first 24 hours of acute stroke care, uh, post-acute uh, post stroke care, and then finally the stroke heart syndrome. I also have a pretty interesting case review if we have time at the end of the talk. So worldwide, uh, there are over 13 million new strokes. Um, here in the United States, each year, we have about 800,000 new or recurrent strokes. Uh, one in four people over the age of uh, 25 will have a stroke in their lifetime. And globally, over uh, five and a half million deaths are reported from stroke. And sort of despite the progress that we have made in stroke care, it is uniquely devastating in part because it remains one of the leading causes of disability here in the US and worldwide. The major metabolic risk factors associated with stroke include hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. Some of the behavioral risk factors include smoking, uh, poor diet, and physical inactivity. To a lesser degree, but potentially intervenable risk factor is environmental exposure, um, especially nanoparticles, particulate matter 2.5 and household pollutants. I think the, the biggest takeaway from this data is that upwards of 90% of risk factors related to stroke are intervenable. Meaning if we could significantly reduce stroke incidence with primary prevention strategies. So here's a pretty simplified timeline of the major studies that have changed um, acute stroke care clinical practice. In 1996, IVTPA was approved in the US with, within three hours of symptom onset. A number of years later in 2004, mechanical thrombectomy was approved for strokes within eight hours. Um, but for whatever reason, thrombectomy wasn't really adopted into clinical practice at that time, except for really basilar artery occlusions. Uh, then in 2006, the Europeans published uh, the results of ECAS-3, which showed safety and efficacy of IVTPA up to four and a half hours from symptom onset. So that's all kind of the, the old news. And then over the last decade or so, there have been a number of new studies greatly impacting stroke care, uh, which is what I'll be talking about. Um, but before I get there, um, I wanted to briefly review the process of a stroke code. Um, so stroke code should be called on any patient with acute onset of neurological symptoms in a 24 hour window. Objective data that is important includes vital signs, uh, point of care glucose, uh, and this is the only lab data we actually need to proceed with IVTPA. But it's also nice to have um, coagulopathy labs and platelets, especially in ED code strokes. Um, especially if we don't have the patient's medical history. All stroke codes get a non-contrast head CT and a CT angiogram of the head and neck. If the CTA does show a large vessel occlusion and the last known well is over six hours, we will proceed with a CT perfusion scan. The CTP uh, is not needed within a six, six hour time window, although many times in clinical practice, we do end up getting it. And then MRI brain scans are usually reserved for basal artery occlusions or wake up strokes. We obtain the MRI and basal occlusion to really understand the extent of injury, but typically 
basal, occlus basal or occlusions are life-threatening, so we tend to be incredibly aggressive with those patients. And then with this information, we will usually decide um, whether IVTPA is appropriate and whether to proceed with thrombectomy. So this was a case I saw a couple of weeks ago. This was a 38 year old female who presented with some mixed aphasia and right-sided plegia um, that started about 10 hours prior to the scans um, here. So the non-contrast head CT over here on the left side of the screen shows sort of this left subtle hypodensity in the lentiform nucleus in the basal ganglia. So you can see this area is a little bit darker compared to the other side. Um, and then she went on to get a uh, CTA here on the right side, and that shows that she's got an occluded um, distal M1 with a tandem M2 occlusion right here. So given the time frame, she didn't qualify for IV TPA, um, but she did go on to get a CT perfusion scan. So the T CT perfusion scans are sort of automatically evaluated by certain software to give us an estimated cerebral blood flow and transit time. Um, so here on the left side of the uh, screen here is the estimated cerebral blood flow. Uh, this is shown in purple right here. And this represents the core of the stroke. And then here on the right side of the screen, this is the T max greater than six seconds. Um, and it's shown in green here. And that represents the penumbra. So the core is the tissue that's already infarcted. And then the penumbra is the tissue that's at risk of infarcting. So now, for now, you can take my word for it. But based on these numbers, she did qualify for mechanical thrombectomy. Um, she, she underwent thrombectomy, but unfortunately, uh, as you can see in her MRI scan, she still did have a pretty large area of infarct on her MRI. But the good news is clinically, she's continuing to improve with sort of only minimal language impairment and some reco recovery of her motor function. Um, the next few slides are some of the scales um, we'll need to know before reviewing some of the stroke studies. So this is the NIH stroke scale. It's basically an abbreviated neurological exam. Uh, it really captures the anterior circulation strokes like a MCA stroke, um, but it's not so good at picking up posterior circulation strokes. Uh, the ABCD2 score is a tool used to assess the risk of stroke in a patient presenting with TIA. So a TIA is defined as stroke symptoms that are resolving within 24 hours and no lesions on the imaging scans. The higher the score, the higher the risk of stroke in the short term. For instance, you know, a patient with an ABCD2 score of four uh, has a 6% risk of stroke at seven days and almost 10% risk uh, at 90 days. Here at Harborview and UW, we unfortunately do not have a rapid access TIA clinic, so the majority of our TIA cases do get admitted. And then last and certainly most important scale is the modified Rankin scale. This is the outcome measure uh, used in the majority of stroke studies. So an MRS of zero is, indicates no symptoms at all. Uh, an MRS of one, no significant disability, but has some symptoms. Two is slight disability, and, but able to perform their ADLs and IADLs. And then a three has moderate disability and requires assistance with ADLs and IADLs. But up until this point, patients can ambulate independently or with a cane or walker. So an MRS of four, they are unable to walk unassisted and have moderate to severe disability. Five is severe disability and bed bound and six is dead. Okay, so before um, 2018, IV TPA was indicated for stroke with onset within four and a half hours and thrombectomy within eight hours. But since then, we've had a number of studies expanding these time windows. Um, so the IV TPA trials I'll be discussing is the wake up trial, the extend trial, and the extend TMK. And then the thrombectomy trials that extended the time window are diffuse three and dawn. In 2015, there were also a number of um, studies that were published that reinforced the efficacy of thrombectomy treatment. Um, these included like Mr. Clean, Escape, Swift Prime, uh, Extend IA. 
So I'll start with the IV TPA studies. So the wake up trial was published in August of 2018. It was a multi-center randomized double uh, blind placebo controlled trial of patients of unknown time of onset of stroke. The study enrolled 503 participants, but it stopped before reaching its target of 800 due to lack of funding. The study utilized MRI brain imaging with the inclusion criteria of diffusion restriction with no flare correlation. So this was essentially a way to estimate the last known well within 24 hours. So the study didn't really expand the time window of TPA as much as utilize imaging to estimate the last known well. Uh, and in this particular study, they did exclude patients getting thrombectomy. Um, so the two images here on the left side show a right frontal parietal diffusion restriction and then on flare, there's no hyperintensity. Um, and then compare that to this two images on the right, um, there's a sort of left frontal diffusion restriction and you can already start seeing in hyperintensity on the flare. So the patient with the images here on the left would qualify for TPA based on the wake up trial. So the, the primary efficacy outcome was a favorable MRS. And then for this study, that meant an MRS of zero to one. So patients with you know, no symptoms or just some symptoms, but no disability. In the Alta place group, uh, about 53% had an MRS of zero to one. And in the placebo group, it was about 41%. Um, so this image on the bottom here is used in most stroke publications. It's reporting the range of MRS scores in sort of this horizontal bar, uh, stacked bar graph. It's a, it actually has a, a specific name called the Grota bars. Um, and for this study, it shows in patients receiving Alteplase that there was a higher percentage uh, with an MRS of zero to one. So just another visual depiction of uh, the data. The safety outcomes did show a higher rate of parenchymal hemorrhage in the Alteplase group, but this was within sort of the expected range of, or rate of hemorrhage even in the initial TPA trials. So for instance, when I'm consenting a patient or family for TPA, I quote the risk of hemorrhage related to TPA administration at about 5%. So in the Alteplase group, there was about 4% in this study risk of hemorrhage. So it's sort of within the normal range we expect. The other TPA trial is EXTEND. So this was published in May, 2019. It was also a multi-center randomized placebo control trial. This trial specifically included patients with last known well between four and a half to nine hours. Uh, the inclusion criteria was based on perfusion mismatch with a core less than 70 or a mismatch ratio greater than 1.2. Uh, the median NIH for this study was 11, um, so it was included pretty moderate uh, range strokes. One of the biggest limitations of the study was that about 72% of the participants had large vessel occlusions but did not undergo thrombectomy. This in part may have been occurred prior to the extended time windows or lack of thrombectomy capable centers. Um, and then also enrollment for this study ended early due to the publication of uh, the wake-up trial and the loss of clinical equipoise. So the primary efficacy outcome was again an MRS of zero to one. And then as the table shows, there was a slightly higher rate of symptomatic um, ICH in the Alteplase group. Um, but again, you know, it was 6%. So that's within sort of the normal range that we would expect with TPA administration. And again, here are the grata bars. Um, and as you can see, there's kind of this shift um, with higher percentages or numbers of people um, having better outcomes at 90 days. So the extend IA, T, and K, uh, this was not an extended window study. However, I thought it was interesting to present. So tenecteplase is not um, in the neurologist wheelhouse. We just don't really use it. However, this study did show that the efficacy and safety was just as good as Alteplase. And it, it furthermore sort of showed, you know, a higher rate of recanalization of occluded vessels. 
So the primary efficacy outcome was this recanalization or reperfusion. And in the TNK group here, it was almost double compared to the alteplase group. I think this is clinically important, especially in this region, um, as a lot of our stroke patients are transferred from you know, community hospitals around the state and Southern Alaska. And transfer times can be anywhere from you know, two to six hours or maybe more. And you know, in that time frame, you can sort of cost a lot of brain tissue. And so TNK is given as a bolus, which is in, in turn sort of you know, better for workflow as well. Um, so currently here, we're still on alteplase, but there's still some discussions about maybe moving towards tenecteplase. Um, all right, so moving on to mechanical thrombectomy. So the, the DIFFUSE 3 trial was published in February 2018. Uh, they enrolled 182 participants in the trial. They included uh, patients with terminal ICA occlusions and proximal M1 occlusions in the six to 16 hour window from last known well. The inclusion criteria was a core of less than 70 mils or a mismatch ratio of greater than 1.8. So the primary efficacy outcome uh, was the median MRS score. So the intervention group had an MRS of three, which as you may recall was ambulate independently with moderate disability. Uh, and then the MRS in the medical arm was four, which was moderate to severe disability um, and ambulate only with assistance, which I think from sort of a patient level, this is a pretty big difference in delineation. Um, and then the 90 day mortality rate was 14% in the endovascular group and 26% in the medical therapy group. Uh, and there was no significant between uh, group difference in the frequency of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, which was um, I think 7% in the intervention group and 4% in the medical group. So this is an important reduction in mortality and it's likely related to reducing malignant MCA edema uh, with the thrombectomy. I think one of the drawbacks of these trials is the median age was around 70. Um, we have quite a few patients who are in their 80s and 90s, which makes it difficult to determine sort of benefit risk in this particular age group. The DON trial looked at the, um, expanded that window even more, and it looked at the six to 24 hour window with an inclusion criteria that was based on age. Uh, they enrolled 206 participants and in participants less than 80, a core of less than 30 with an NIH greater than 10, or a core less than 50 with an NIH greater than 20. And in patients who are over 80, the criteria was much more narrow. So a core less than 20 with an NIH greater than 10. So in this study, there were co-primary outcomes. Um, and one of them was the utility weighted modified Rankin scale and the other was MRS less than or equal to two. Um, so the utility weighted modified Rankin score is completely different from the regular MRS. So a score of zero is death in the utility weighted MRS versus a score of 10 is no symptoms or disability. Um, I'm not sure why the authors thought that this would be something good. I think it's just confusing. Um, and as the bar shows, as the bar graph shows, there was you know, significantly better outcomes in the thrombectomy group, um, regardless of sort of timing. So they actually split them into subgroups with six to 12 hours in this top um, comparison. And as you can see, sort of MRS of less than two here, there's a significant number um, in the thrombectomy group and then same in the 12 to 24 hour group. So the number needed to treat for both of these thrombectomy trials was two and three, uh, indicating that maybe the selection criteria was quite narrow. Um, but regardless, clearly there was a significant benefit um, with intervention. Um, and I was actually at the International Stroke Conference in 2018 when these trials were first published and there was sort of a standing ovation of about 5,000 neurologists. It was pretty nerdy, but pretty awesome as well. Um, so this was actually a patient of mine. He was a 70-year-old um, who presented with a terminal right ICA occlusion. 
And as you can see in panel A, so this is a cerebral angiogram, there's a sort of a distal ICA occlusion. And then in panel B, uh, the stent is deployed in the proximal M1 right here. And you can already start seeing reperfusion of the anterior cerebral artery. And then panel C here is the end result. So there was complete reperfusion and we call this a TIKI-3. Um, and then this panel D was his follow-up MRI. Um, and as you can see, the, the bright area or the diffusion restriction was the resulting area of infarct. But if you can imagine, um, had he not undergone thrombectomy, this area of infarct likely would have encompassed this entire right hemisphere. <clears throat> so our current stroke guidelines at Harborview, Northwest, and UW is IVTPA up to four and a half hours with extended window considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And then mechanical thrombectomy up to 24 hours if they meet the inclusion criteria of Dawn and Diffuse 3. And then we make um, sort of case-by-case -case decisions on M2 occlusions and PCA occlusions. So moving beyond the 24 hour period, I wanted to highlight the medical interventions in the first three months after stroke. So here are the studies I'm gonna be covering. Um, so the CHANCE trial was published in 2013. It was conducted in China with just over two or 5,000 participants. Um, the two trial arms were aspirin and clopidogrel for 21 days compared to aspirin alone. One of the major limitations to this trial or generalizability was the uh, homogeneity of the population. Um, and then furthermore, stroke in China has a much higher mortality rate compared to the US, indicating there is likely sort of a significant difference in the stroke phenotype as well. So the dual antiplatelet arm had a lower rate of recurrence um, compared to the aspirin alone group. So in the dual antiplatelet, it was about 8%. Aspirin alone, it was about 11.7%. Additionally, there wasn't any significant difference between the bleeding complications between the group, two groups as well. So the point trial was essentially the chance trial equivalent of the Western hemisphere. Um, this trial enrolled about 4,800 participants. The two arms was aspirin and clopidogrel for, for, for 90 days versus aspirin alone. Some of the differences in the trials uh, was that the loading dose for clopidogrel was 600 in the point trial and 300 in chance and the duration of treatment. So 90 versus 21 days. The inclusion criteria was mild stroke defined as NIH less than four or a high-risk TIA defined by an ABCD2 score of greater than four. So this trial was actually stopped early due to high rates of hemorrhage in the dual antiplatelet group. So the primary efficacy outcome was recurrent ischemic stroke, myocardial infarction or death due to ischemic vascular causes. And then the dual antiplatelet group um, there was a lower rate of these events compared to aspirin alone, but in the safety outcomes, there was a much higher rate of major hemorrhage in the dual antiplatelet group. So why has the point trial sort of affected change in stroke care? Um, looking at the secondary analyses, there was uh, a treatment effect according to time, meaning there was a clear benefit of dual antiplatelet therapy in the first seven and the first 30 days. Um, of treatment. Uh, alternatively, the risk of hemorrhage in the dual uh, antiplatelet group was greater in that eight to 90 day period. So sort of combining what we know from chance and point, uh, we usually do dual antiplatelet therapy on mild strokes or high-risk TIA strokes for a 21 day period. Um, lastly, the Thales trial. So this was uh, recently published in July, 2020. Um, it was another dual antiplatelet therapy, um, but instead of clopidogrel, they used ticagrelor. So the two intervention arms was aspirin plus ticagrelor for 30 days versus aspirin alone. And again, the inclusion criteria was mild stroke defined as NIH less than five and an ABCD2 score greater than five and non-cardioembolic stroke. Um, so the DAPT arm had significantly less death and stroke at um, 30 days, 
However, there was more uh, moderate and severe bleeding in the dual antiplatelet group. Um, there was not significant, so this has not really imparted much difference in our clinical practice. Um, and I think it's just because we don't have as much experience using ticagrelor and it tends to be much more expensive um, than clopidogrel for our patients. So stroke due to intracranial atherosclerosis is, um, the treatment's largely based on Sam the SAMPERS trial, which was published in 2011. The two arms of the study was aggressive medical management um, and stenting. The aggressive medical therapy group included dual antiplatelet therapy for 90 days and risk factor modifications, including lifestyle programs. And this study also ended early due to high rates of adverse events in the stenting group. So the aggressive medical therapy group did have lower rates of recurrence of ischemic stroke um, compared to the stenting group. Um, but obviously, you know, the stenting group had sort of done remarkably poor um, overall. Um, the medical arm for, did not uh, have as much major medical um, bleeding events either. Um, but there were a number of other trials sort of before and after the SAMPRS trial using dual antiplatelet therapy for intracranial athero for 90 days. And these included the WASA trial, CLARE trial, and the VISIT trial. So to summarize the indications for dual antiplatelet therapy in stroke is 21 to 30 days for minor stroke or high-risk TIA or 90 days for intracranial athero. Um, these are the evidence-based reasons for dual antiplatelet therapy, um, but there are times sort of depending on the case that we do employ dual antiplatelet therapy for either you know, conditions outside of those two criteria or for longer periods of time. Um, and then briefly, the FLAME trial in 2011 showed a benefit of uh, motor recovery in patients on fluoxetine for 90 days after a stroke. However, this benefit was actually disproved in a relatively recent trial called FOCUS. Um, so we now do not routinely put patients on fluoxetine unless they're exhibiting uh, depressive symptoms. So this was actually a major change as most stroke patients prior to 2018 were started on an SSRI and tended to stay on this therapy for prolonged periods of time. And then the final couple of trials I wanted to review, you all likely already know. Um, so the EMBRACE trial showed um, with 30 days of ambulatory ECG monitoring, there were higher rates of AFib detection. And in this trial, AFib was defined as duration greater than 30 seconds or more. And then this was further supported by the Crystal AF study um, with implantable loop recording over a three year period. So these graphs show sort of a very large um, area between the two lines. So um, sort of the Y axis is the sort of incidence or detection of AFib. And you can clearly see in the implantable loop recorder group, there was a much higher rate of detection of AFib. And in this study, AFib was defined as rhythm greater than 30 seconds. So in embolic appearing strokes or cryptogenic strokes, we always recommend at least a 30 day cardiac event monitor. If our suspicion is high enough, we also sometimes will recommend an implantable loop recorder. The problem with AFib is it's still unknown how long an episode of AFib needs to last to truly increase the risk of stroke. And then furthermore, it's difficult to attribute the cause of stroke to AFib if it's detected after the stroke's already occurred. Um, and I'll be touching a little bit more on this topic in a couple of slides. Um, so that was sort of the brief update in acute stroke care. Um, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time discussing this entity of brain-heart axis. Um, so it's estimated that about one and a half million deaths globally are related to neurocardiogenic mechanisms. You know, these include post-stroke cardiovascular complications, um, SUDEP or sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, and Takotsubo syndrome and neurogenic sudden cardiac death. 
there have been a lot of studies trying to understand the pathophysiology of the brain-heart axis. And the best regarded hypothesis attributes it to changes in the autonomic nervous system and inflammation. The brain houses the central autonomic network um, and it can modify sort of heart rate and contractility in states of rest, um, physical activity, you know, emotional responses, and then also psychological challenges. So the areas that play a role in the central autonomic network include sort of areas like the prefrontal cortex, um, the insula, uh, the periaqueductal gray here, um, and then also sort of the vagal nucleus uh, and the vagal nerve, and then also the nucleus ambiguous as well. And this, there's both an output and an input via the sort of efferent and the afferent pathways respectively. <clears throat> Lateraliz lateralization remains controversial. This was one study's attempt at identifying, you know, specific clinical outcomes with laterality. Um, so for instance, you know, in this study, they felt the left insular cortex was more so involved in sort of these arrhythmias, um, you know, versus the, uh, the peri-insular area may be in involved in sort of the, the cardiomyopathy type stuff. But there's been a number of other studies that kind of say the opposite. So, you know, I think it's safe to say the clinical relevance of lateralization on cardiovascular autonomic function remains uncertain at this point. So stroke induced heart injury is sort of the pathophysiological process leading to stroke heart syndrome, uh, which is the clinical cardiovascular outcomes that can occur after stroke. The stroke heart syndrome includes ischemic, non-ischemic uh, acute myocardial injury with elevated troponins, uh, myocardial infarction, left ventricular dysfunction, um, including heart failure and Takotsubo, ECG changes and arrhythmias, and then this entity known as neurogenic sudden cardiac death. Um, so the stroke heart syndrome. So this data is from this population-based cohort study in Ontario from 2002 to 2012, and it was uh, included about 21,000 participants. So in patients with first ever ischemic stroke with no known cardiac history, had a 25 times higher risk of incident major cardiovascular events at 30 days post-stroke. Um, which sounds pretty horrifying. And, and then at sort of one year after an ischemic stroke, about 9% experienced um, it either myocardial infarction, heart failure, a new diagnosis of coronary artery disease or coronary revascularization um, or cardiovascular death. And in intracerebral hemorrhage, that rate um, at one year was about 4%, and then in subarachnoid hemorrhage, it was about 9%. So in all stroke patients, the usual cardiac workup includes a troponin I on admission, a BNP, uh, an ECG, telemetry monitoring, uh, usually at least for 72 hours, unless they have a reason to continue monitoring, a TTE with bubble, and then in special circumstances, such as, you know, a young person with stroke, you know, concern for endocarditis or intracardiac thrombus will also request a TEE. It is estimated that 30 to 60 percent of stroke patients will have an elevated cardiac troponin. This varies depending on the sensitivity of the assays used in the study. Um, one of the difficulties in stroke patients with an elevated troponin is sort of determining what the underlying etiology is. So is it just an inflammation issue? Is it myocardial ischemia related to sort of oxygen supply demand mismatch? Um, or is it actual myocardial infarction? So a small study of 29 patients with acute ischemic stroke and elevated troponin um, had diagnostic angiog uh, coronary angiography. And of those 29 participants, only 25% of them were found to have a culprit lesion. lesion. 
And then furthermore, men with ischemic stroke are sort of eight times more frequently diagnosed with subclinical coronary disease than women but women are just as likely to have these elevated markers, indicating that there is some underlying non-ischemic mechanism that's occurring, and especially more so in women. So there is, there is an ongoing um, study called PRAISE, which stands for Prediction of Acute Coronary Syndrome in Acute Ischemic Stroke, which is a prospective um, study to determine the frequency of ACS and characterize cardiac and coronary pathologies in sort of large cohorts of ischemic stroke patients with troponin elevations. So this was actually a proposed algorithm on how to manage patients with acute ischemic stroke and elevation of cardiac troponin. Um, so, you know, if they have a troponin that's greater than the 99th percentile, and on serial measurements, they had this rise and fall that was greater than 20%. You know, they sort of went down this pathway of acute myocardial injury. Um, obviously, I think this was sort of designed for the non-cardiologist to better understand the underlying mechanism of elevated troponin. <clears throat> so moving on to the left ventricular dysfunction. So, the incidence of LV dysfunction in a study of approximately 1,200 ischemic stroke patients was about 31%. Uh, in another study of 208 patients with intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, that rate was about 7%. And then in a study of 40 patients with subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage, 20 of them were found to have left ventricular dysfunction. And interestingly enough, the LV function returned to normal within seven days in 13 of those 20 patients. Um, and then most of these studies were in sort of the short term, but most indicated some permanence of LV dysfunction in the ischemic and intracerebral hemorrhage groups. So Takotsubo syndrome is a distinct form of heart failure with uh, usual improvement over a six month period or so. The actual pathophysiologic mechanism of Takotsubo remains unknown, but acute stroke is a known neurological trigger for it. It is estimated that Takotsubo occurs maybe in like a half to 1% of ischemic stroke patients, and then upwards to 25% in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. I think regardless of the stroke type, subtype, um, Takotsubo has proven to be sort of a poor prognostic factor and is independently associated with death in acute ischemic stroke patients. Um, and then arrhythmia. So uh, after excluding patients with known heart disease, um, ECG changes were detected in upwards of 32% of ischemic stroke patients, 46% in intracerebral hemorrhage patients, and 75% of subarachnoid patients. Um, the arrhythmias that we typically saw in ischemic stroke patients was AFib, SVT, uh, ventricular ectopy, uh, VT, and sinus tachycardia. Um, furthermore, sort of, you know, beta blockers are sort of the drug of choice to reduce sympathetic hyperactivity and prevent uh, cardiac remodeling after myocardial infarction. Um, but it still sort of remains unknown whether there could be a benefit um, in stroke patients with sort of these similar findings. Um, there are a couple of studies that are starting to specifically look into this area. <clears throat> and then finally, AFib. Um, AFib detected after stroke or AFDAS, um, which I believe is sort of a newer entity. Um, and it's described or characterized by a lower burden of AFib episodes with over half of these patients with um, AFib less than 30 seconds. So this begs the question is, if AFib is af detected after stroke, is it associated with higher risk of recurrent strokes? So this was evaluated in this population study of about 20,000 people. And they found that AFib detected after stroke had the same risk of recurrent ischemic stroke as the group with just sinus rhythm. However, patients with AFib prior to stroke 
had a much higher risk of recurrent ischemic strokes, and that was estimated at about 25% higher risk. So the concept of neurogenic AFib after stroke challenges the thought that, you know, all types of AFib diagnosed in stroke patients have a similar underlying pathophysiology and outcome. So there is another ongoing initiative. It's uh, the pathophysiology and risk of atrial fibrillation detected after acute ischemic stroke, um, or dubbed the PARADISE initiative, which is a translational approach that includes population-based clinical and experimental studies that will hopefully provide a better understanding of neurogenic AFib um, mechanisms after stroke. And then finally, um, sudden death related to stroke or neurogenic causes is very difficult to estimate. Um, it requires sort of autopsy data, which is usually not available. And then even the definition of neurogenic cardiac death, it varies widely in the literature. Um, so the actual sort of burden of, of this entity is really unknown. The pathophysiology is thought to be related to sympathetic overstimulation affecting the myocardium and the conduction systems. Um, and that's sort of all I had, but if we, I think we have a couple of minutes and I was hoping to review this case, but if we have a, a ton of questions, I'm happy to sort of end here as well. Um, I think you should go ahead with the case discussion. Uh, great. great. All right. So this was a patient I admitted in, I think it was mid-January, uh, to the neurology service at Harborview. She's a 60-year-old female with multiple risk factors, vascular risk factors, um, including a history of coronary artery disease with a drug-eluting stent placed in 2018. She was found during that admission to have a left lateral medullary stroke, um, that we thought was related to small vessel disease. She did have uncontrolled diabetes with a A1C of over 10%. Her stroke admission troponin and BMP were both normal. Um, and then her T TTE was also completely unremarkable. And then on hospital day two um, of admission, she had sort of a rapid response code blue that was called. Right, uh, immediately um, prior to, she apparently had walked to the bathroom and then walked back with the nursing assistants, felt lightheaded, then became unresponsive. And this lasted for maybe about four to five minutes. And then she was sort of completely back to normal at about 30 minutes later. During this code rapid response, she had a troponin and an ECG that was um, both unremarkable. Um, eventually she was discharged home with dual antiplatelet therapy for 21 days atorvastatin 80, and then diabetes management. So this was her ECG during the code, and it was sort of exactly the same as her admission ECG as well. And to sort of a non-cardiologist non eyes, it looked um, you know, pretty stable and unremarkable. Uh, this was her MRI. So you can see this kind of tiny little area of diffusion restriction in the left um, uh, medulla. And then you see the sort of ADC correlate is dark. That indicates that this is a, a relatively acute stroke. And then you can sort of start seeing a faint hyperintensity on flare and then same on T2. Um, unfortunately, about three weeks later, she presented again to Harborview Emergency Department with acute onset of chest pain. And then on admission had negative troponins times two and she underwent sort of cardiac catheterization and was found to have, you know, 80 to 90% stenosis of her OM1 and had a stent placed. She was loaded and restarted on dual antiplatelet therapy and discharged home. Uh, and again, this was her um, ECG from the admission for the, the chest pain um, in the ECS. And honestly, to me, it looked pretty similar to the one where she had her stroke admission. Um, you know, so looking back, you know, I'm not really sure there was anything I would have done differently during her stroke admission, even though I know she came back three weeks later. Um, but just wanted to hear your thoughts about, you know, is there, or was there something that we could have done, um, during the stroke admission to hopefully prevent, or at least capture that she was about to have sort of a coronary, um, ischemia. And that's 
pretty much all I had.